All right, thank you for joining us for the More About You annual review workshop. I'm Glenn Lubert, and I'm here with my co-host, Cliff Gurren. Hi, Cliff. Hi there, everybody. So this is a uh, re-recording. We didn't get the recording started at the very beginning of the last session. So I wanted to give you a little bit of overview before we drop you into the live session. And we started off the workshop by doing a poll and looking at the number of people who were taking this, doing this annual review for their first time, the second time, or three or more times. And 96% of the people answered that this was their first annual review. So the questions when we're answering them, they are framed towards people doing the first annual review. However, we this is an iterative process, as we know, who those people that did, have done it before. And you learn something more every time you do an annual review. So I think anything that we talk about is going to be valuable in your iterative process of doing a new annual review. The second poll we did was on whether you had taken a building, the building in a second brain course, read the building second brain book, or are currently taking the building second brain course. And the vast majority of the attendees were uh, in that camp. So again, the questions are uh, answers are geared towards that uh, audience. So let's get into some of the key questions we frame this around before we drop into the live session. And Cliff, can you tell us a little bit about why we uh, created this annual review? Sure. So uh, as many of you may know, uh, Glenn and I were both mentors in the Building a Second Brain program. And uh, when we first met uh, several years ago, we found ourselves talking about what helped, what aspects or what attributes help people succeed in uh, building a second brain. And what we realized is that having a clear sense of your values and then your goals were really important to then building out a second brain that reflected those values and goals. And this may seem obvious, but in truth, a lot of people who were in the program really weren't clear about those aspects. So we decided that it was important for us to develop an annual review workbook, which focused on values and goals, but didn't just say, uh, what are your values? What are your goals? We wanted to provide the context for these questions and really build out a program that integrated those things into the whole annual review process, goal setting process, and ultimately weekly review process. Uh, so that was the impetus for the workbook. We're now on our third version. And with that, um, Glenn, why don't you talk a little bit more about how the role that values and vision play in guiding your year ahead? Yes. Thanks, Cliff. That was a great summary. And the values, uh, to try to keep on the value subject, that really is a defining part of how you want to reframe your, your year and your year ahead. And looking at those values helps determine what you want to do, what you um, want to do better. And uh, this part of the process uh, is really what we wanted to start with. And particularly looking at your purpose, the, the having a purpose to find helps uh, guide you as a North Star where you want to go. And while you might uh, while you might come up with other things that you might want to do, again, the North Star helps guide you in that right direction. And trans and pur purpose takes changes over time and over a lifetime. So you know, again, don't don't get too caught up in what your purpose is, but set a North Star and set a direction. I think that's really one of the key pieces of this uh, of this part of the, the workbook. And so the, the, the next last piece we talked about before we jumped in again into the live session was the trying to get a minimal, useful annual review without it being so uh, overburdening. You know, this workbook has, is all encompassing. And we all say in the workbook, don't do everything if you don't, you don't need to do everything. You can obviously if you want to. Um, and you might get to that point where you have an iterative process where you get to everything in it, but you don't need to do everything. And so what is that, that um, simple, useful annual review, Cliff? Yeah, um, thanks, Glenn. You know, th and this is something that we talked a lot about uh, as we did this year's update. And we really wanted to make sure that uh, you felt uh, that you were given permission, if you will, to basically create an annual review that works for you. And of course, everyone, all of us want to be good students, especially if you're, you know, you're coming out of BASB, many of you, we all want to succeed and, and hit all the um, uh, points in BASB first time out. And in fact, like BASB, even then we 
counseled people. It takes several iterations to, of the course to really get a handle on the full process. Well, it's the same with your annual review. You don't need to do it all in the first year. In fact, we would recommend that you not even try because you're going to find yourself overwhelmed and you'll be in March still working on your annual review. Instead, try to pick out the sections that resonate for you, the things that you're most excited about thinking about, about doing, about remembering, and then um, pardon me, build towards an annual review that works for you, the minimum viable review, if you will, one that basically enables you to understand what your direction is for now. And I think the emphasis here is on now. We're not suggesting that in one annual view, review cycle, you're going to ferret out your entire life's mission and course. Um, and in fact, your annual review will be a way that you can uh, reframe or redirect uh, every year as your circumstances change. So what you really need to do is just say, what's, what's a good enough review for now? One that enables me to clarify my goals, clarify my actions, and get going. So that's our, our, our advice on a basically a good enough annual review. That's fantastic. Thank you, Cliff. And so from now, we're going to drop you right into the live session where we were answering questions on goal setting, and then we'll eventually get into a Q&A with the participants. So we hope you enjoy the full workshop video, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Work on your review to the point where you feel like I know I now am excited. I know where I want to go. I can start uh, working, clarifying my goals, start, you know, clarify my project list, et cetera. And then use the interim steps of the monthly, uh, weekly, monthly, and uh, half year reviews to uh, build on that process. And I know Glenn uh, is, does this very, very effectively. So I want to talk to him about that and about how he uses uh, these other review cycles to feedback into to, to basically build, add more stones to the cairn. Let me put it that way. Go ahead. Right. So you, should, we, should we talk about goal setting next? Um, sure. All right. Um, so for goal setting for the year ahead, you know, after you've done what you feel is your review of what you feel has given you an insight to the previous year, then I like to transition into goal setting um, right away and be able to look at, I start with actually, I just, actually, I just take out a piece of paper and I, and I put all the months of the year, um, uh, the top six months and the bottom of the paper, the second six months. And then I just start, you know, I, you already know some of the big rocks that you have in your, in your life that year, you know, you're going to have a vacation, maybe you've already started planning or you have um, uh, a wedding or um, in that mix or you already have, especially in the first quarter, you've already got probably projects that you are you already have committed to from pre from the end of the fourth quarter from the previous year. So you're moving into that already knowing, hey, this is what January, February pretty much already looks like. And then I know I'm going to want to do this and this and this. So you have some big rocks. Your first six months are going to be more accurate than your second six months. And this gives the idea that you know you're able to already get a good sense of what your your goals are for the year then you know go back and start filling in some granular pieces of the puzzle and what what i think that um cliff was referring to is this what this goal motivation stack and i and i talked about the transformative purpose at the beginning of this session and that's why i think it's so valuable to do because when you have your per transformative purpose and you write out your goals for the annual goals for the year there, and the high hard goals are things that you might want to do in the, within the next two to 10 years. And those are great to have a, a little bit of an insight and I, you, can re you keep revisiting those every year and c calibrating. Same thing calibrating with the purpose every year and seeing if it, oh, do I want to tweak that a little bit? Then when you do your annual, re annual goals that we're doing right now, then that sets you up to do your quarterly goals. And that sets you, because so the quarterly goals are just a derivative of the annual goal, annual review goals. And the monthly goals are just a derivative of the quarterly goals and so forth and so forth down the line. So here's where it becomes valuable. It's all of a sudden you're, you realize this is a mundane task that I don't feel like I want to do. However, when you can click, connect that mundane to do goal with all the way up the line 
you start looking like, oh, I'm doing this because of this, which I'm doing because of this, which I'm doing because of this, which you're doing coming this, which I'm doing because this is the purpose I'm trying to achieve in life. This is my North star. And so when you stack it up like this, this helps with the most, like, I don't want to do this mundane task. Oh, right. I'm doing it because this, this, and this, that helps with the, the motivation to get going. And that's why I feel this is such a uh, valuable uh, thing to have in your, as your transformative purpose. And then, you know, you, you, then the, these reviewing these week, weekly goals, that's a lot for a lot of people to do the weekly goals. Um, you can start with a monthly review of your goals, go back to the document. All you do is go back to the document and say, okay, what did I do this month? What I want to do next month? Um, every quarter you could do the same, but then in the quarterly goals, you're really referencing your annual goals because you're trying to see if those align. And then, okay, then when you do your monthly goals, you're really analyzing your quarterly goals to see if those align for the quarter. So it just brings things down closer and closer because when you make this annual goal list, it's a big, it's a big lit. It could be a big uh, daunting thing. This is what I'm going to do the entire year. You got to just bring it down smaller and smaller in chunks. The smaller and smaller chunks help with uh, alleviating procrastination and driving motivation. Any, any other thoughts on that, Cliff? Uh, yeah. The, um, you know, when you talk about uh, all the parts and pieces of, of this, it can, it can seem complicated. And it can seem like a lot. And one way just to really think about this is you're just trying to develop a cadence that works for you of review and reflection. And if you're doing that, uh, you are starting to lay the groundwork for basically achieving your longer term goals. And so, for example, uh, my wife and I, we, every week, every weekend, we just look at our calendars and say, you know, what did we, what happened this week? What are we doing next week? Um, are we in sync on that? What are the things that we need to work on that are some of our longer term goals versus, and some of our short term goals? Uh, and it's not a very formal discussion. It's just, uh, it's not like we have a, a form that we go through. We go through it with just a, a yellow piece of paper and just write down something that we can both refer to during the week, it sits on the counter and we can just check off a few things that we get done, particularly the stuff we don't want to do, like all the house maintenance stuff and dealing with that and just making sure it gets done. And, and that alone, step by step, leads us towards our larger goals. And, you know, of course, uh, from time to time, we sit down and say, you know, how are we doing uh, in terms of where we want to be and what the things we want to work on? Uh, whether it's a big project, uh, an upcoming family event, or even a small project. And that is a form of review and reflection that uh, connects us and both uh, as a couple, but also connects uh, uh, us individually to the things that we want to accomplish. And so uh, it is, it is um, it's review, reflection, really, and then learning. And, and just being honest about what's working, what's not working, uh, you know, it, it, whether it's you doing it for yourself or you doing it with your partner or even a, a group of people you're working with. But this practice, this practice of review, reflection and learning is really what I think uh, is critical to the overall review process um, and, and growth process and then achieving your, your goals. So I, I would simplify it just to that little uh, phrase. Yeah, I also add on to that, that this is this is a iterative process it builds upon itself every year because you go and you're like oh if i do this during the year then this will make this annual review easier and it'll make it more robust for example when i do my weekly reviews and this could just as well be done in a monthly review is the, one of the first things i put on the list is what are my successes for the week again this is based in uh, solution focused psychology and it's put you, it gets you motivated because it's looking at the strengths that you already have and you write down these are the key things that I did this week. You accomplished something this week, um, even if it's the smallest thing. And so writing those down, uh, you don't I mean you don't have to you could just think about it, but writing it down has another level of resonance and it also has another side benefit that when you go to do your annual review, you already have 
a list of all the successes you've had for the year. So you can go through and just pull out your, your, your key biggest successes that you felt like. And when you do, so when I go do my annual review for the previous year, a lot of it is just what, reading down that list and boy, that feels really good to read through 12 months of uh, mostly every week when I'm writing something down and then you're, you're pushing that dopamine through your brain, which dopamine then gives it, gives you the motivation you need to, to keep going into the next thing and the next thing. Um, just real quickly, I do want to say, cause I know some of you may think, well, you know, uh, we talk about re review and reflect and learn that that's, um, I'll call it um, uh, squishy. Um, there is also a lot of science behind this. And so this uh, graphic here is really, uh, I wrote a post on uh, basically systems theory and its relationship to doing annual reviews. And uh, it's uh, posted on my, on my website. Uh, and uh, you can see from this that really the cre the critical thing here is creating feedback loops. And in this in this uh, article, I walk through what happens when you have a system that doesn't have feedback loops and why it breaks, and then what happens when you actually add in one feedback loop and then multiple feedback loops. And so there really is um, uh, a lot of science behind the idea of doing uh, regular reviews, both for your uh, 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 ability just to manage projects, uh, projects that you're working on, but also to achieve your longer term goals. So uh, I just wanted to share that with you. And um, uh, I'll uh, put a link to that um, uh, post in the uh, in the chat in just a minute. I have to look it up. So um, with that, um, Glenn, we wanted to turn at this point to actually just the mechanics of doing your annual review and how your annual review actually connects to your second brain system. Right. So one of the, so how do I actually do my annual review? It's again, trying to keep this really simple. I don't want to make this a daunting task. So these are, these are notes I have in a notebook in Evernote. I have a goals uh, notebook and in there I have just a few notes. The, one of the notes is the successes that I'm uh, keeping. So every every uh, week when I'm writing out my successes, I have a note for successes, and the I have a, also I'll have another one for gratitude I, that I keep as I, I go throughout the year. So that way, when I go to do the do the annual review, I'm just going through those existing notes. I also have a note that is my my goals for the year, and that note includes the uh, the the pieces that we talked about, the transformative purposes at the top, you know, what are my high, hard goals, what I want to do in the one in 10 years, and then the breakdown of the, the different areas that I'm working on. And what I've learned is that keeping the goal list small is really what uh, makes it uh, useful. And one question I always ask when I put down an area that I'm working in, so say I'm working in my health, Oh, you know, it's always a good area to have for, for goals. The, the key question I put at the very top, and this again is solution focused. What am I working toward? What am I working toward? What's my direction I'm going? That's what we're, we're always just trying to get directionally right, because there's a lot of things that are going to uh, happen that are uh, putting us off pace and may not eat, uh, meet a metric, but am I going in the direction I want to go? And I think that's the, the minimal uh, piece that you want to put that in there is what am I working toward? I also, in my document, try to put in there my, my detail in there, my fantastic day. What does that look like? And, and those are key pieces that fall at the bottom of that. But it's just one uh, note that I look at and then I keep going back. And when I do my next quarterly review, I just pull some stuff out of that, pull some stuff out of that. So it's a bit, really pretty basic. How about you, uh, Cliff? Yeah, you know, um, I have tried over the years a number of different ways of actually doing my annual review, um, and I want to relate, uh, uh, tie it into uh, my second brain in just a moment, but I've gone from, just as Glenn uh, mentioned, using basically a, a document, whether it's a Google Doc or an Apple Note or whatever, um, to uh, doing it in a more structured Word doc using our template as we, as we develop that, uh, and this year what I did is I 
for my own purposes, I took all the areas in the template and broke it apart and used a visual note-taking tool, in this case, an app called Walling, uh, to basically create my uh, annual review as a wall. Uh, and, uh, and part of the fun of that was uh, to be able to uh, see the different sections and uh, 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 have a nicer presentation of the photographs and the al album covers of the music I listened to. It was just a way of making it fun. And so the key thing here that I want to convey is try to make it fun. And you could do your annual review as a, a collage. Uh, you know, that you do on a board and just write things and paste them and have fun with it and put some keywords on it. And that could serve as something that you just use in your, put in your office or in your room, or you could do it as a digital collage in a product like Miro, whatever. It really doesn't matter what, how you do it, but I, I really want to encourage you to make it fun. This is not supposed to be um, a, uh, an unpleasant task. And so I always want to, uh, you know, I start out by saying, look for what resonates. I would tell you now, choose a way of doing it that makes it fun for you. And one that is going to speak to you throughout the year. If reading a long list of goals and so forth isn't really going to resonate with you, then find another way to present that that does. Because at the end of the day, this is the value in this is making it something that you can, uh, you feel excited about and good about going back to. So, um, and, and so let's talk for a moment, though, about how all of that informs your second brain system. So as, as um, first, of all, I want to make um, a comment about your second brain. And some of you, I'm not sure where all of you are in terms of uh, building your second brains. But um, if you are early on in the BASB process, you're probably focused on building your second brain with one tool, um, which is the right thing, whether it's Evernote or Notion or uh, Obsidian, whatever you've chosen for your second brain. And you're looking at it as basically the go-to place for all of your notes. And that's a great start. But what you'll find over time is that your second brain will start to encompass a number of different tools that you use to basically manage your digital life. And so in my case, for example, I've been using this app called Walling, which is again, similar. You've heard, probably heard of Scrintle or, or even Notion, whatever. It's, a, it's just a different version of that that has some features I like. Um, and so that's becoming more part of my second brain system. So the, the idea here is um, you, don't, you don't have to do your uh, annual review in the tool you're using for your second brain. You just have to make it part of your larger second brain system, that collection of places that you frequently go to. Now, the benefit of your, of your annual review is that it's going to give you guidance about things like your projects, your you know, para projects areas, uh, resources and archives. It, the projects area is, is going to um, be driven by uh, your goals and to some extent your areas, basically in areas, the things that become projects, the things that bubble up. Your values will inform your areas in a heavy way. So for example, um, if, uh, if you say, um, and your resources, by the way, but let's just say that one of your values is public service, then um, you're going to have uh, in your, uh, uh, um, in your um, areas, something related to public service, because that's an ongoing area of responsibility and possibly something in resources that supports it. And so when you ask yourself what your second brain should look like, um, I, I always counsel people that your second brain should excite you. It should be a reflection of the things that basically are engaging your attention, your energy, uh, your, you emotionally, um, you spiritually, that, that is the, that's what should inform your second brain. And so by doing your annual review exercise, you are basically giving yourself visibility into those things that reflects back into what actually goes into your second brain. You know, I and I, I have to say, since I I did building a second brain in the second cohort, we're in the 16th cohort now, and I can't remember what life was like before um, having doing this annual review process and um, and the second brain because it's it's so ingrained and and, and such a foundational structure that that uh, acts as um, acts as a. Uh, <clears throat> 
acts as a foundation so that way when when the, when the storm invariably comes you know you you have a way to go back and say oh wait here's my foundation there's a book by scott barry kaufman it's called transcendence and in the book he um he was a, he's a student of abraham maslow and if you're familiar with Abraham Maslow, there's the Maslow hierarchy of needs that we have to, that we have our need, our, our basic needs, and then we move up to self-actualization. And it's pre presented as a pyramid there. And, and you know, you um, could think that you just moved up the pyramid. And then once you hit self-actualization, you're there and you've, you've arrived. However, that's not what uh, uh, Abraham Maslow had intended. And when uh, Scott Barry Kaufman uh, went through all the literature that he wrote, even stuff that was unpublished, he came back with a different metaphor for the uh, hierarchy of needs. And he likened it more to a sailboat where you have the hull of the sailboat. And in that hull, those are your basic needs. And then in the sail, you get up to the higher level needs and the self-actualization. And so when the weather is bright and the wind is blowing just nicely, you, you let out that sail and you just go, that's where you get into flow states and you get to, uh, you get to just let yourself go and, and, and have all your goals and all your ideas flourishing and thinking. However, uh, we, we are humans and in life storms come along and they could be bad storms and you don't want to leave that sail open because it'll rip through the sail and you'll have no way to flourish in the future. So when the storms come, you pull in that sail and then you focus on those basic needs. And I think that's where the second brain comes in and, and your and your annual review and your goals. Those that's that's the, the, the structure that helps build the whole of your uh, basic needs. And so I like that metaphor to be able to connect these uh, vision and purpose and um, and annual review process that connects with our second brain into a uh, higher higher picture there. That's awesome, Glenn. Thank you. And that's a really good point for us to stop and open this up to questions. So uh, we'd be happy to take your questions. Um, and uh, we're happy to run uh, long if there's more questions that we can answer in the next few minutes. Um, well, Cl so uh, Cliff, how about we, um, how about we uh, take these, uh, we, we have only three minutes of the quarter of the hour. So let's, or two minutes. So let's do the, the final two uh, roundup slides and then we'll take as many questions oh, as, sure. as you have. That, that sounds good. Uh, give me just a sec uh, to show that keynote again. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. All right. Thank you. You want to take this one? No, you go ahead. I'm going to post this stuff into the, uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. I can take the first one. Yeah. The first one is, um, uh, I'm going to be hosting, um, how to harness the power of your nervous system to crust procrastination. Um, that's uh, going to be with my, uh, partner, Dr. Deborah Teplo, which I, I know some of you have test, uh, texted me a message about, and that'll be on Wednesday, January 25th, uh, coming up here and I'll we'll drop the uh, link here in the chat as well. So you have that. Oops, I think that link didn't work. There we go. There you go. Yep, it's in. And then we also, as we mentioned, uh, Cliff and I have the Second Brain Superpowers course. This is where we go into more of how you take the, the second brain that you're building right now and take it to uh, the really harness the superpowers that you can come out of it. We match uh, how to have our creativity and match our use our second brain for our creativity and use our second brain to help get into flow states more consistently so we have that coming up yep and, and we, we're that'll be coming up a little later this year and we'll definitely keep you posted so, so if you want to you, um, you, you you'll be in the if you want to put yourself specifically on the list there's the link to that um and we do have your email address so we'll, we'll keep you informed in one way or another and uh, again, here are our email addresses, and we invite you to reach out to us, visit our websites, uh, mine that you'll find my, uh, uh, the archive of my newsletter, uh, Metaphor, which comes out every two weeks, uh, most of the time. Um, and uh, and uh, you'll find uh, basically uh, two years worth of articles on uh, creativity, uh, basically tools for the tagline is tools for a uh, productive, creative life. 
And Glenn? Yes, and um, my website is also on there, and I write at the intersection of technology, behavior design, and well-being. So if you uh, want to reach out to each of us for any questions on how to work on your second brain, we'll help, we're will happy to help you as well on that. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, wraps up all of the things you wanted to talk about. So we'll just now open it up for any questions that you might have. Perfect. And feel free to unmute. We're, uh, we're small group. You can just unmute and speak up. Okay, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, on average, what's a good amount of goals for a year to have? Well, I'll take that to start off. I think uh, I think I alluded that to that before. Um, I I like to have um, I I find that less is more. So I find that I really like to focus on some one key directions that I want to go. And my first quarter goals are going to be much more clear because they're being informed by what we what has just happened. And then my third quarter and fourth quarter goals, you know, I have, and I, and I think having them by quarter gives you a lot of flexibility rather than saying, Oh, this is what I want to do in this month and this month. Um, because the, the times, you know, we have things that change and move around as we go through. And it, even, I, I, you know, I ran a, a very successful uh, technology company for 20 years and the uh, reality was, you know, technology is changing so much um, and that it was really hard to predict more than a few uh, two to three quarters ahead anyway. So I try to uh, keep less is more and then build off of those things here. There are actually, this is where I want to go, but, and then maybe a couple of key programs that we want to do, but then as the year goes, it, is this still going in the direction I want to go and adding, adding more goals as I go along? I don't know if that helps. Uh, I'll give you a specific number. It's five <laughs> plus one. And here's the logic of it. Five goals, are, you can easily remember your top five goals. I think it's tough to really remember 10 goals. So five, so five goals and then one stretch goal. So if, if I just got these five, I'd be super happy. And if I get, if I get those five plus one, that's, that is even better. But I don't, I, for me, that, that's uh, just an approach that works for me because I want to be able to quickly say to myself is is this really one of my go goals and if not um then uh uh you know treat it appropriately um so five plus one and i used i use that uh this year i tried using that for everything that i wanted to try my top projects five plus one and so forth my cliff, goals five hey, plus one hey cliff what's it what is a stretch goal oliver asked a uh, stretch goal basically is something that would be nice to have or nice to, to uh, d deliver, but um, you're not basically, it, it's not your top priority. So it's, it's the nice to have. It's the thing, it's the edge case, basically. It's the thing that's on the edge case. Um, and look, again, these are not super hard and fast. It may be that your edge case becomes more important because of circumstances. As Glenn said, you, you know, it's hard to plan. And you know, the part of the idea of doing at least quarterly reviews is to really accommodate the fact that we live in a in a very dynamic world um so uh the stretch goal is the one that sort of you get your bonus your personal bonus if you if you uh if you meet your stretch goal so it's if all you, game, it's all at, mind games you play with yourself yeah definitely and if you put if you put if you look back on that uh the, the thing about the chart that i have where the air ups the transformative purpose i had weekly reviews there and i had calendar everything because the goals are, are are the outcome really it's the process that you're putting in place every week so if i want to write if i want to write um four blog posts a month uh that is a goal but i have to put the process into place so i i would have to have i for example for me i have a calendar time blocked off every monday morning is my writing time that is that's what i what i have and maybe i don't get to four blog posts a month but i'm doing the process i'm doing the process every week and the process is what it, the outcome is what it is and if, if it's if the outcome is not what i want then i need to update the process and i mean maybe i need to have two days a week where i'm doing that so that way i can hit this uh goal but that's why the calendaring part of this 
Um, that's when you go that's and that slides inside the uh, workbook too. So you can go back and reference it, but that weekly review and then calorie during it um, helps do that. As well as having, like I said, some key, when I go do my calendar review, like half the calendar is already filled out because I know I, know I want to have a writing session every Monday morning. So, and there's other ones of those things that go, go throughout the week that match with my uh, goals. I'm launching a podcast this uh, year in the first, in March. So there's podcast time every week uh, blocked off for that podcast. And so when you start putting some of those blocks in that are going to be the process for your end goals, then you start to see, oh, wait a second. I put those processes in place. I have calendar items every week on there. Now I have these... 20 other goals, when are they going to happen? And that's where the, that's where the, really the rubber meets the road is on that calendar because there's only so many hours in the day. And so that's when reality check comes in and says, okay, I really want to do these things. These are my highest priority uh, top five, like uh, Cliff said. And so where are they going to fit on the actual calendar in addition to taking care of the kids, working out, cooking, you know, all those things are the, uh, even, even my, my calendar, I obviously have the workouts, but I also even have make, um, these are my dinner time uh, on there because those take up this time of the day. And when you do that, here's less, what, here's what's left inside the, the calendar for the rest of the goals. And uh, Diana uh, asks, how you, how do you leave uh, room for serendipity if everything is on a calendar? And yeah, you know, the, um, the answer to that is well. First of all, I, I don't tend to be as scheduled as Glenn, uh, which is you know it's all personal calendar problems. serendipity. Ca calendar serendipity, actually. <laughs> exactly. I you know, but I do like the uh, I I do use time blocking, and time blocking is saying there's a certain amount of time dedicated to something, uh, but uh, I also be careful to leave basically blocks open because I know totally. that on, any, on any given day. I'm not going to be able to, uh, the things are going to come up. So I always leave open space. And um, that also allows me to run long if uh, if I want to do something uh, or I'm in a groove and I just want to continue doing what I'm doing. So it's, uh, uh, but it's 100%. an art. And, and, and look, yeah. let's face it, different people, I, I don't have young children at this point. Uh, so uh, um, I have 30 somethings, which are a whole different, you know, and grandchildren, which are a whole different deal. So the point being that if you have young children, you need to leave more um, unscheduled time on your calendar because, you know, basically we all know that uh, younger children don't follow, you know, uh, the schedule, <laughs> um, or nor are they supposed to. So, um, and so you have to, so that's a reality you have to accommodate in your calendaring. Totally. And also the, I think, I feel like the beginning of my week, I have the, the structure much more, uh, the, the calendar much more structured with the end of the week, not with like almost no structure because then, then I can take those blocks and say, Oh, this is not, I want to stay involved in like I'm in flow and I want to keep working in this project. So, Oh, this is, this can be easily moved. This is, doesn't have a hard and fast time that needs to be done on Monday. I can move this into Thursday or Friday, that type of thing. Um, serendipity wise too, I, I do a lot, of, I go to a lot of meetups, um, to, to, in different areas that I'm interested in. And so that gives a lot of serendipity time to interact and talk to people that, um, aren't, uh, specifically with a, a purpose in mind. Um, and then, you know, these communities like building a second brain, those are great for lots of serendipity too. Uh, and yeah, I think to connect that back with the second brain though, capturing those notes is part of the process. So, you know, when I, if I go to a meetup or, you know, we, we do one of these online sessions, you know, capturing, if I had a conversations with somebody, what was something they said um, or something I thought, what, what's one thing I thought I heard uh, or, or said to myself and capturing those notes, those are some, some of the most valuable notes you can take. The, I call them fleeting notes. I don't know if you have another term for them, uh, Cliff. Yeah. Um, the, uh, fleeting notes is, is uh, the um, Zettelkasten term for them as yeah. well. Yeah. Let's, let's, which is good. Let's, um, uh, we have a couple of other questions that I want to make sure we get to. Um, so uh, one of them is that, um, uh, and these are all sort of uh, related. Andre said, not everything is sunshine and rainbows. Uh, we focus heavily on the positive parts. So how do you deal with failure and disappointment? And do I have to frame them like I'm grateful about them so I have learned X, Y, or Z? So uh, I'll, I'll start on that one. Um, yes, failure and disappointment are 
part of life. Um, we all we all know that. Uh, so uh, so thank you for raising that. I think the key things that um, we are trying to uh, focus on is that in terms of the annual review process, um, basically, and it depends on the kind of you know the source of the, uh, why you you know you failed and so forth. But um, in terms of planning for your future self, um, there's a lot of research that shows that focusing on your successes is far more productive than your failures. So let's start with that. So and you can pull out your strengths. It's a solution focused piece. Yeah, exactly. Solu it's a solutions fo solutions focused approach. Absolutely. That said, in terms of dealing with failures. I think you have to be, uh, ha you have to, we talked about review and reflection and learning. Yes, I think it's worth reviewing and reflecting uh, and learning. And some of them may because you didn't do as well as you would have hoped um, that we are imperfect beings. Um, you have to be kind to yourself. You have to learn from that and then you have to let it go. Um, and I think that um, part of, um, part of this is choosing not to live um, in the uh, dark space of your failures and instead choosing to live in the um, brighter area of success of your uh, uh, brighter area of your successes. Um, and uh, and that's that can be very difficult. That was certainly difficult for all of us during COVID. Um, you know, it was hard to sort of uh, find uh, uh, the positive, um, but you know, uh, it's a choice that we make uh, to live to choose not to live in negativity. And and when we struggle with that choice, it's important to try and get help. And not it's not everyone can get out of that on their own all the time. And there are, uh, and the goal is to reach, or the important thing then is to to reach out for help. Because um, I don't want to minimize the fact that sometimes people are in a very negative space and they just can't find a way out. Um, so, yeah, but, uh, so gra gra yeah, as you go, gra you hit up till right there, your gratitude and focusing on your uh, successes and your strengths um, help free frame uh, that and uh, and helps drive you towards the again the the solution of focus. You know, when you're creating be when you're creating new habits. One of the things that people try to say is, okay, how do I break my bad habits or how do I get things? You ne your bad habits are always there. They're never going to go away. Um, and so we, we don't, don't ever fo focus in, in behavior design on eliminating that bad habit. We focus on creating a new positive habit in the, in the direction you're working towards. Again, this is working on the processes that go through your day to day rather than the outcome. The goal is the outcome. It's like the exhaust fumes that after of all the, the good processes that you put into place and you're just keep refining that process and, and falling in love with that process. And, and a, a, a failure is not a failure. It's an experiment uh, result that you have. You have an experimenter's mindset. What, what, when you have something, there is no failure. It is just another piece of da data that you can use to put into your next uh, experiment or your next iteration of your uh, process, and I and I have one last thing on uh, on the failures, and it's a, and I'm putting there it's a it's a poem by uh, Rumi that I like to um, reflect and come back to. It's called the Guest House, and um, it's basically that you know you welcome these uh, things that are coming in, and it's a, just a way to reframe it because it's basically uh rearranging your furniture for a reason so that way they the re furniture wasn't working the way it was supposed to and it needed to be uh rearranged so that way you can be more oriented to the to the future very nice very very nice um what else we got in here? We, i think uh, we uh well um oliver uh the the two sort of open threads at the moment are Diana and Oliver. So if either, if you feel like we've addressed your questions with what we've said, great. If not, unmute and, and feel free to ask your question or, or add, add, add it in the chat. Sharon, go ahead. You, you have your hand up. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. I didn't see that. Hi, um, hi Glenn. Hi, Cliff. Thank you. So um, my question is that, um, so with the building the second brain, I actually have a year tracked of um, um, weekly reviews and some are monthly reviews. 
but I, I basically decided to do this process from November and I wanted to finish everything on um, December the 31st and I didn't get to and I had a meltdown because I had I have so much information tracked of everything of the year and I just didn't know how to um what's it called um how to minimize it and and it's still there so like when we said happy new year I was just like should I continue on these reviews or should I just leave it so I just decided to leave it and so far I'm on like June and and what actually happened with my um daily weekly review is that I I did my daily and my week and my weekly reviews, but I haven't connected the monthly. So what I was doing is just that I was going back and then trying to read over and then and then connecting them to see what happened in that month. So everything is just kind of like all over the place. So I don't know if I should continue that big process or I should just chunk it down. And even from chunking it down, I, I don't know how to chunk all that information into just this tiny little thing that I need. So so let, let me ask you a question. Uh, if you were starting over again for a new year, how would you change your process to make it more manageable and useful for yourself? Um, Fantastic question, Cliff. Well, um, I don't, I don't know, but this year I've started the same process again, but, um, what I've did differently is because um, when I was reading my re reviews last year, I realized that some of the some of them are copied copy and paste templates. So then I I couldn't really understand what happened in in the day. So I have to go back and reread and make sure that everything is in sync with what happened in that day. So that's what I'm doing differently. But it's still time consuming. Like like today was a very um, not much happened today just zoom calls and stuff but if it was like a big day that daily review would literally take me an hour to do for the day mm -hmm. so it's yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's yeah. really long and 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 did having that level of detail on each day um help you during the year i mean is there times when you went back and having that level of detail was useful to you or did it oh. just was it just too much to even sort through uh, it was too much to sort through, but the months that I did manage to sort through, it was really insightful for how I work and and what I need to um, eliminate and what I need to do. And, and I actually um, analyze my workflow more better and I can actually see where, where I'm effective and when I'm not effective. So it really actually did help completely. But... So one idea, just throwing it out here, might be to say, I'm going to do a detailed review like that for say a month. And then I'm going to take two months off and do a lighter process, see where I'm at, and then see what I want to focus on when I dive into the next detailed review. And, and by figuring out what it is you want to focus on as you, as you do those more detailed reviews, you probably will end up spending less time on it because you'll know what it is you're really, the problem you're really trying to solve with that extreme level of detailed analysis of every day. Um, and so uh, so some of the, the, you know, if you take that review and reflection and then act model, you know, you're going, you're, you're, you're going to um, create a cadence for that, uh, but you're not gonna do it all the time because otherwise, you get into sort of uh, into um, uh, in, in your cases that doesn't sound like it's paralysis exactly, but it's such an overwhelming burden that it's undermining your ability to actually accomplish your goals. Yeah, that does make sense. So I mean, just I, a, I, I, Cliff, what I hear is you, you say let's run an experiment and uh, compare compare and contrast. Take take stuff away. When you take something away then you realize, oh, was that valuable? Um, if, do I miss it? Is it something that I'm missing out of my, my process? Um, or, it, you know what, I didn't even notice it. It was, it, was, uh, that, it, was, it was not helpful, so I didn't even notice it. So that's a really good indication when you take stuff away to see if it's valuable. Okay, thank you. I'll try and do that as well. Okay. Um, uh, why don't we take one more question and, and then we'll wrap up. Anyone That's else have good. one more question? 
Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, chat. Yeah, good. Go ahead. Yeah. I know there's some in the chat, so just um, mute because there, there was a lot to read through there. And I wanted to see if anybody has a burning good question. There you go, Oliver. Uh, yes. So, so my difficulty is I hardly remember anything from the past year, especially from the beginning. Yeah, it was so many things happened. And do you have any tips how I can support next year's uh, review on going forward? Any any practical without overloading and putting a lot of notes and so on. Yeah, I think that one of the, one of the key things that I would say is you know the the, the top things you want to have in your annual review. Um, so for me, I, like I talk about is a success list and a gratitude list. Um, how do I can how can I put the process in place throughout the year so that way when I go to do my success list at the end of the year or at each quarter frankly, that it's, um, it's already there. And so I, in my weekly reviews, I do a, uh, these are this, I start off with these are the, uh, five, five to 10 things that I, that were successful this week. And then when I go to do those reviews, that those are already there. So again, start with the end of mine. Yep. Just using it, using your, your second brain system to capture a note and just Just uh, jot down the things without in an, is in, that you're interested in keeping. You know what they are now, um, and just jot those down as they come to mind in a, in a in a simple note. Okay, thank you. It's it's. Uh, I, I mean, I think the, the the point here is that we um, we often tend to think that we need to have a system. A, a complex system for doing something that really um, just uh, we can find a simple solution to. And the, the key to that, to what you're saying, Oliver, is you want to minimize the friction. Um, and so choose for yourself the simplest thing. It could be a notebook by the side of your computer. It could be a note in your, in whatever note uh, tool you use. Um, it could be uh, uh, post-its that you write them on and just put them in order. And at the end of the day, you have a, a deck. I don't know, you, you find something that's going to be low friction for you, because the key is not to have to think about it, just to have a simple place to do it. And then just build the habit. And you're and you're you have like 96% of you, this is your first time through. Um, so what whatever you do is already going to be a 1000 times increase in your uh, value and productivity than it was last year. So whatever you do is going to be fantastic for this year. Cause, and then when you get to the next year, you're going to be like, Oh, you know what? I'm curious. I would have liked to have known this, or this would have helped me. And then the fall, the next year you'll, you'll build in a process to, to build that again, this builds upon itself year over year. And so what, um, what I do after I've done this for 10 plus years, what Tiago does, you know, this is that, that's a system that's been for us customized for us individually, year after year after year after year and so uh don't put yourself in the same bucket as that really refined process or the entire workbook that we we have for you just pick and choose a few things out of there that resonate for this year and start there yeah so Any final I, thoughts Cliff? that yeah my my final thought would also be and don't forget about dreaming um you know, we have a dreaming section in the workbook it's really important to spend some time just dreaming about the future, about uh, uh, writing about what it is that uh, you think you might want uh, for yourself uh, in the future. That section, I think, is a great way to basically uh, connect with the process as a whole. So if you're stuck and you you don't know, you know, or, or you're bored, whatever, go to the dreaming section and have some fun there. It really does um, add uh, a lot to the uh, review process and ultimately toward uh, working, uh, identifying your goals and uh, also, frankly, understanding your values. So, um, I will thanks, it. Cliff. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, and thank you all for all your comments as well. We appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Have a great rest of the day. Bye bye now. Bye.